if you do have the notes, if you don't, just grab out a notepad and we have a lot of stuff we want to kind of communicate and talk with you about. As we work through this, just to kind of give you an introduction, we're not just going to be covering demonic spirits, spiritual warfare and deliverance. We're also going to learn how the spirit of the Lord comes to set people free. And so we'll even be taking some time to do that where I, we bring people up. I'm going to model how you pray for them. Just give everyone a foundation. So please remember this as we're going to look, start looking into the notes. The kingdom of God is stronger than the kingdom of darkness, but we need to become what's called a Holy Spirit present base, and which means we are dependent on the presence of the Lord in any form of ministry that we do, whether it's healing, deliverance, preaching the gospel. And so I'm going to tend towards that. I'm going to talk about how important it is we have the presence of the Lord to do this ministry. All right, so I think it's the very first page. We're going to cover what's called the doctrine of demons. Doctrines of demons. All right, so basically what we want to do here is we just want to lay a basic foundation. Everybody, if they just read the scripture, you're going to come to the idea that there are demons. Interesting enough, as some of you that have been with me in different contexts, I told you that when I was trained in Bible college, in Cara Springs, uh, my professor stood up one day and announced to all the students that there are demons, but they're only in Africa. <laughs> and so uh, the rest of us just thought, well, thank the Lord, we don't have to worry about this. And then there, were, there was always some student or some person we'd minister to that could not get a breakthrough, and we just never assumed it might be a demonic spirit. So God wants to actually teach us about this and give us some wisdom. So the first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the origin and the nature of demons, all right? So basically, um, as we work through this, please understand that demons are fallen angels, all right? And since they're fallen angels, they don't have ultimate power. They only are given the power that God has given angels to do something. So please understand in the order of how God is created, the heavens and the earth, you have God, then you actually have man made lower than him in his image, and then you have angels and demons. So they don't, everyone's always worried about them having more power and stuff, and, and that's not the way the universe is set up. God has more power, you're made in his image, as you walk with him, you have authority over them. They don't have all knowledge, they're, but they're spiritual beings, and they have intelligence, and they have a will even though they do not have a body. So what does that mean as we start this? If demons have intelligence and wills and their desire is to do evil, that means that when they draw near to people, their desire is to express their will or their personality in some form of evil in somebody's life. So that means that to start off, that means they're going to communicate with you or give you their thoughts and try to get you to go their direction to do something. This is why it's so important in the body of Christ that we understand that we can hear both the, king, uh, the Lord speak to us or the kingdom of darkness. It's thoughts that are coming to us. Uh, there, not every one of them is originated in our own, and we have to get comfortable with the fact that as we're going along in life, we have to pay attention to where did that thought come from? Did it originate in my soul? Did it originate from the kingdom of darkness, or was it the spirit of the Lord? And so... These uh, demonic spirits ha want to express their will through people, all right? And so even though they lack physical body, they want to give a knowledge and they want to release power to cause an evil purpose. So as we go through this, just understand the nature of demons intentionally is to do evil. Uh, they're not there to play games or have fun, and they're not cute little entities. They're rebellious angels that are resisting the Lord. And because of that, they're, they're at war with both God and mankind. They're not our friends. They're our enemies. All right, so the influence and activity of demons are per, uh, depicted as adversaries to humanity. So they, they have a plan. They have a plan to actually disrupt what God wants to do and to deceive people. Interesting enough, just to stop right here, you like writing little notes the word deceive is really kind of fascinating because it doesn't just mean lie to. It means to bring people into darkness so they cannot perceive truth, reality, or experience what's called the light of Christ's glory. 
And so the idea of being deceived is the idea, it doesn't mean that you cannot think, it means that you are brought into a darkness not having the ability to perceive spiritual realities. So if you watch people that um, communicate with demonic spirits or function in the occult, they're, they're relating to the supernatural realm, but they have no ability to understand truth ultimately, and they're always being led around in darkness, basically. All right, so when we talk about this is what they want to do with people, they want to deceive, and they want to stop God, and they do various activities. And so one of them is this. They want to, they want to cause people to engage in a sinful lifestyle, and we're going to be looking at an illustration that Jesus used about this. So Jesus comes on the scene and he says, so, you know, when I drive out demons, and he uses an illustration of a house. When I drive out demons, I, I sweep through the house, I put everything in order, and then something has to fill the house. Well, when he's using that kind of language, he's trying to describe the enemy wants to come into the soul of mankind and mess everything up so they have a dwelling place. So the, the access point of demonic spirits is to entice people to sin and to get into what's called habitual sin. And this causes an access point for demons to afflict people. Now, demons don't just attack you emotionally. They attack you physically, which we're going to look at when we look at the gospel. And since they do that, it can be a combination of it. It could be one, he's, uh, sometimes demonic spirits attack you just emotionally where they terrorize you, and other times they're doing something to your physical body. Now, you should be asking this question right up front as I'm explaining the origin of it. How would I know? How would I know I'm actually dealing with a demonic spirit? Well, this is why we have to learn how to function in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He gives us discernment, and he tells us this is what you're dealing with. Um, how many of you, have, uh, just to see where the room is at, how many of you have had any training on spiritual warfare or any background in deliverance ministry, and you used to have charts where you just read down the chart trying to figure out, okay, if they, if they lust, they must have these 17 demons connected with it. How many of you have ever had that experience? Okay. Now, do you know why that's, that sometimes does not work? Because you have to discover the root of the access point, and then the Lord has to tell you what you're dealing with instead of doing what's called the shotgun approach. So the shotgun approach assumes that all these demons are always clustered together, and that might not be the case. And, and you have to understand that the Lord wants to go to the root of the problem to deal with a demonic spirit, not have you figure out every spirit that's harassing somebody. All right, so the next one is this. So they, uh, they oppose what's called the message of God, which is the, the fact that they do not want the gospel brought forward, and they want people in destructive de behavior and spiritual bondage. Now, this is interesting. I'm just going to kind of give you a, an idea here. I, when I was in Africa several years ago, I was getting ready to go preach the gospel, and I'm behind this wall as they're doing the worship service, and I'm just trying to wait on the Lord and go, so what, what do you want me to emphasize, or where's your heart? And the Lord, out of the blue, just starts having a, a conversation with me about the influence of the demonic in the United States. And I'm like, I'm here in Africa. Why are we having a conversation about that? And I guess I needed to be separated from the United States so I could hear him about the United States. And he started laying out to me that our culture, demonic spirits, influence our culture through media to create Christians to be ashamed of presenting the gospel. It's a constant assault on believers not to present the gospel. They do not want the gospel to go forward in our culture, and there's a reason why, because that's the power to set people free. So they want you to be sensitive to people, they want you to embrace every, everything, but they do not want you presenting the gospel. And they're trying to get it to the point where they're saying it's actually becoming like a hate crime or an offensive thing. And it's an assault from the demonic realm through men to stop the preaching of the gospel. Um, Okay, now let's do authority and the defeat. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ has ultimate authority over demons and has power to cast them out. But I, that's true, and I, these are my notes, and I'm looking at them going on, I needed to add this part. Go with me to Luke chapter 10, real quick. 
Luke chapter 10. And we're going to be in verse 17 through 20. So um, to kind of introduce the passage to you, what's going on, this is really interesting. This is Jesus sending out the 70. So this is not him sending out the 12. This is now him sending out the next group of people to go do ministry. I could, I could get off on this and, and show you a hundred different things where we're talking about dealing with demons here, but I want you to focus on something with me. Jesus is, set, is telling them, I am going to send you out, and then he describes himself as being the Lord of the harvest. All right, so he sends them out. They're to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and that's kind of all you're told. So they actually go out, and this statement right here in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, he's describing how the Lord does the harvest. So this idea that while this is just for the 70, he's giving what's called the statement of how the kingdom comes into every culture. The Lord is the Lord of the harvest, which means he knows exactly how to do the work in every location. And when he sends people out, he's intentional about how he sends them out. They're to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and function in the miraculous. That's how you bring in the harvest. And then he says that the the fields are already ripe and ready. So once the Holy Spirit has come into human history, it's time for the harvest to be brought in now. You don't need to wait 20 years. Pray faithfully, hope God does it. He's saying, no, actually the 20 years of your prayer is get your heart ready to go do the work I called you to do. The harvest is now because the Holy Spirit's among us. He's doing this work. All right, verse 17. He actually, they come back to the Lord and they're full of joy. Why? Seventy return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, it, do you guys, uh, interesting enough, most people don't go study this stuff because one, they don't know it's out there and two, it sounds kind of boring. But historically, at this time in Israel's history, they had people that did exorcism, but they actually did it more based on... Um, finding what they would call a formula or a word. So can you believe that the nation of Israel got to the point that they believed driving out demons was finding a specific word? So if they found a word, they believed that demons would actually be delivered. And it's a form of magical thinking. And Jesus is having to actually deal with that because demons and demonic expulsion was a common thing in all these nations. They had constant manifestations of demons because of all the idol worship and all the channeling of spirits and all these temples that they had for either Baal or Isis or the combination of Moloch, all those things. They had the whole worship service was for people to be invaded by these demonic spirits. They called them gods, but the Bible says, no, these are, these are demons. And so there was a constant thing that even Israel knew this, and they were trying to drive out demons, but they didn't know how to do it. And so they were trying to find what was called magical formulas. And so this is why you see the the shock of the 70 is they're saying, wow, it's just by your name this actually worked. Your name actually carries this power and authority. And so he says to them, "Uh, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I've given you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. All right, so we need to stop right there and have a discussion. You know, I've looked at the original language uh, a lot and when Jesus says, I've given you power and authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, it actually means all It doesn't mean, in some cases, demons still have more power and authority over you. He's saying, look, the kingdom is so powerful, God is so powerful, that demons do not have authority or power over you, only what you let them have. And also, Satan doesn't have power and authority over you. It's only what you let him have. He says, I've given you authority. So let's stop and develop authority. When we talk about authority in the kingdom of God, there's two ways that it's expressed. One is called the demonstration of authority. The other is called a position of authority. 
Would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2? And let's look at something here. Ephesians chapter 2. All right. We're going to be in verse 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. What we are laying as a foundation now is what is called your, your, your identity or what's called positional authority. Now, the minute you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been given this authority. Uh, you don't earn it by doing good works. You don't do it by learning things. This is actually it's tied to the idea of your identity God's love for you, and the structure of authority in the universe. So the minute you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, this was part of your inheritance. You've been given this level of authority. So it's, it's called positional authority. All right? So look with me at verse 5. It says this, Ephesians chapter 2, Even though you were dead in your transgressions, uh, Christ has made us alive. I'm sorry, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he has raised us up with him, and he has seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. All right, so he's now saying God has done this work, and then where are you in regard to all authority in the universe? You're seated with Christ. Now, some, actually, in some translations, they actually have it as you're seated on, it's almost like you're seated on his lap. Other ways it's described as where Christ's ultimate authority is. That's a dwelling place, and you're in that dwelling place with him. It doesn't matter how either way you look at it, it's trying to get across the point this. When Jesus stands up and says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he's saying there is no higher structure of authority in the universe anymore. I'm the king of the universe. All that's going on in the universe is based on my authority. You're actually with me. You're the highest authority with me. And so there's nothing on this planet that the enemy can do that you do not have authority of in me. So that's your position in Christ. So that's the first level of authority. It's called positional authority. The second level of authority is called exercising authority or demonstrating authority. So how do you learn that you have authority? You have to get under the right structure of authority. All right, so even though you have a positional authority, it's called delegated authority, which means you cannot do whatever you want in a situation. You have to hear the voice of the Lord and do what he's doing in a situation. Right, Because the reason we have power to do these things in authority is because we're being led by him and he's telling us, do this in this situation. Um, the first time my wife and I got in this situation of driving out uh, several demons out of a person, um, I had no experience. The Lord just kind of indicated to me a couple weeks earlier, I, I'm going to take you through a training course on how to deliver people. And I thought, oh, I thought I was going to get a bunch of books, and all of a sudden, periodically, as I'm going through the week, people are manifesting demons. And then I'm trying to figure out how in the world do I deal with this? Because this is back in the 80s. There was some stuff written on it, but there wasn't a lot. And I'd have to have the Lord tell me. And I'd sit there and, and kind of yell at the, the demon that was talking through a person, and they just kind of mocked me. And I thought, wow, I really don't have authority. That's what I was supposed to learn. I don't have authority unless the Lord led me to set them free. And he did. He showed me how to take them through the process of doing. That's some of the stuff we're going to talk about. But guys, you have a position of authority, but you learn to exercise it by doing what the Father is doing in a situation. You don't do it by your own initiation. All right? So let's keep moving on. So believers have been given an authority to resist and overcome demonic forces by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? So this is a good time to just stop and show you what I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do is, I, is everyone in the room comfortable with the fact that I'm going to call on you to answer questions? And I'm going to probably pull you out of the audience periodically and minister to you? And if I point at you and I say, hey, what do you think about this? If you don't want to answer because you're made in the very age of God, you're allowed to say to me, Brian, shut up. 
and leave me alone. All right. But if you're willing, I'd like to just demonstrate this. So would you mind coming up here? Yeah. Yeah. So the last phrase that I said here is we overcome demonic spirits by the power of the Holy Spirit. So can you just stand right here and turn towards them? All right. Do you mind? I'll tell you what I'm going to do before I do it so you're not scared. Um, most people are like, I don't even know if I want to come up because most ministers punch and do all that other stuff, so I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to have you do is just put your hands out like this and just uh, focus your attention on the Lord. And I want you guys to watch how God does ministry because this is the foundation of doing deliverance. Holy Spirit, would you come right now and would you bring your power and your love to your daughter? In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Thank you, mighty one. All right. Um, I'm just going to move close here to you. Do you sense the Lord ministering to you? Does that make sense to you? I mean, I feel his presence. Okay, that's, that's him ministering to you. Okay, do you feel power or love or peace? Peace. Okay. So... And deliverance, as we're going to start learning, this is what starts setting people free. This power that comes that we describe as love or peace is the power of God that dispels evil or demonic spirits in people's lives. So we have to get comfortable with this. So the Lord's ministering to her. So I'm going to move over here. You guys watch her. This is how we learn to do this, right? So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would uh, continue your ministry and increase your love and your power right now. And we just thank you, Lord. And we bless your name. Now, let's say that we're in the process of doing this, and someone comes up to you and says, man, I'm really struggling in an area of my life. I, 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 I have terrorizing dreams, or something harasses me, or they say something like that. You want them in the presence of the Lord before you minister to them in any area of their life. Why? Because the power and the authority of the Lord is now resting on them. Strengthen her, Lord. Just bless her. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your love. Just wash over her. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Wow, you did a really good job. Thank you. Uh, did you sense the Lord either speaking to you or increasing his love or his power? Or what did you experience? I, um, <clears throat> I just experienced I was longing for more okay. of him and just asking for more of okay. him um, and just kind of a peace. Okay. All right, thank you. You did a wonderful job. You can have a seat. All right. Yeah, you guys are allowed to clap. I, I don't have this thing that you're not allowed to do, that kind of stuff. All right, turn to the next page. What's the final judgment of demonic spirits? Well, the Bible says that demons and Satan will face the final judgment and eternal punishment. Where do we get this? Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Uh, and the devil has deceived them, is thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, and the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. So that's their final judgment. All right. With that being said, uh, we're now going to move past spiritual mapping and go to the section called Views of Principalities. Views of Principalities. So we're going to work through this, and then we're going to talk about the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. All right? Kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Now, how, again, I just want to see where everybody's at. How many of you have had any training on, well, there are demons and then there's principalities and powers and stuff. Any of you had any kind of, anyone even refer to that in scripture outside of just reading it? So one person, two, three. Okay, good. All right, so let's look at the idea of principalities, all right? So why don't you guys turn with me to Ephesians chapter six real quick? Now, when we, the reason why I'm covering this and I want to begin to lay a foundation on this is because most people, if they get any training on deliverance, they focus on what's called individual deliverance. 
All right? But we're, we're, inter- we're entering, I believe, a different time in the grace of God for the whole body of Christ. I believe that God actually wants to bring cities to him. So um, if he wants to actually bring a city to him, you're going to face different demonic spirits that are over cities, not just what they're doing in individual people, but what they're doing in the culture. And so we have to actually have some knowledge about what they do to cultures because they do things to cultures. So before I introduce this, I, I just want to kind of tell you how I figured this out outside of it being in Scripture. Uh, one of the privileges I get is I get to travel around the United States, well, actually the United States and around the world. And just by traveling between Colorado, Kansas City, and Minnesota, it's like you're in three different United States. They all have different struggles in different regions that everyone's just used to and they assume is normal. But if you leave it and go to another city, you'll find out that that city has its own struggle with something that they're they're just used to and everybody just assumes this weakness is common. And then you'll go to another city and you'll find out that they have their own unique struggle. So out here in Colorado, I was born and raised here. I just thought it was normal for everybody to have dreams and assume they'd fail because there's a principality over this region that steals people's dreams. Uh, I also found out that this region struggles with hopelessness. Why? Because the principality that steals dreams also has these spirits create and communicate to people in this region that they can't, they shouldn't have hope in God because all their dreams fail. There's also a a big uh, mental illness uh, where Not everybody's running around being crazy, but just confusion because of the strongholds in this region. Now, how did I pick that up? I leave Colorado and move to Kansas City, and one of the major uh, principalities over the city of Kansas City is false religion and racism and prejudice. It's it's so common, everyone just talks like that all the time. The first few months my wife and I lived there, we'd just hear everybody just say incredibly racist things as though it was normal conversation, and we just look at each other like, I can't believe people talk like this. I mean, in the body of Christ and out of the body of Christ. And they have no problems with talking with different parts of the the people in Kansas City, like those people, they deserve what they get, they're evil, and and that's just considered normal. All right. So most of you are probably aware that this is going on, but just assume that's normal. Well, the Bible wants to come to you and say that's actually not normal. That's the enemy trying to exert his influence over a region because God has a redemptive plan for that region. So let's work on principalities. What's the uh, definition and the nature of them? Ephesians chapter, uh, you guys are there already. We're in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Now we'll be covering this hopefully. But in verse 12, it tells us this. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. All right. So when we use this, this is the term that they translate as principalities. So this means that there's a structure of evil intent that comes from demonic spirits. And they come into regions because people of influence allow them to begin to minister through them and they set things in what's called authority. And the power to do it is based on witchcraft, all right? So again, you don't have this in your notes, but if you like writing little parts on the side of this, How many of you have ever heard the word witchcraft, the term being thrown around, and everybody thinks it's all just someone cast in a spell or something that you would have saw in Disney cartoons? It's just silliness. Please understand the word witchcraft carries the idea of sorcery. We're going to look at that, but it also carries the idea of rebellion. So anytime someone disobeys the Lord and there's a power for them to cause influence, that rebellion is called witchcraft. And the reason the term is put together, witch and craft, is witch has to do with influences of people that channel demonic spirits and craft is tied back to the Genesis account that the devil was crafty. Right? So it's demonic spirits exerting their power to establish wrong authority in a region. All right? 
That's what when we say these demons do this or a demon over a region does this, they have a certain way they want the people in that region to, well, we'll just get it into it. Think, reason, function, and live so that they stay in bondage. All right, so let's look at it. Principalities are spiritual beings that operate in the heavenly realm. They have authority and dominion over a geographical region, nation, and cultural sphere. They, enter, they exercise influence over human affairs, and they shape societies and systems. All right? So um, I didn't learn this in the United States. I actually learned this by going to Guatemala. Um, there, in Guatemala, um, there's this person that uh, we went to at this church called El Shaddai, and the pastor of the church was part of this thing called the Spiritual Warfare Network of um, the... South America region. I, I didn't even know there was something like that until I went and was part of this conference. And they're very serious about this because they're trying to figure out how to get the whole nation of Guatemala to come to the Lord. So they're, they're just thinking on a different level. And uh, he, he pointed this out and some stuff of his I was reading, he pointed out to the fact that uh, their nation had never had... Um, the influence of the gospel will have more power than the occult. They've never had a Christian leader. And the Lord started talking to him about strong men. You know that passage where it says, if you don't bind the strong man, you can't plunder his goods. And he said, most people think of strong men as principalities. And he says, what's interesting is a strong man is a person that has human authority that's high, and a principality comes and joins him to influence the culture. And so when it says strong man in the original Greek, it, it really isn't strong man. It's either a mighty being or a mightiness with authority connected to it. So it could, it could either be a principality or it could be a principality that works through a person that has authority. So guys, cities have authority of evil that are being expressed. And they're working to influence people of authority to express their will. Why are they doing that? Because they're following the way the universe is set up. God has created men and women to be the legal authority on this planet to create either good or evil. So when someone is not in alignment with the Lord, what are they in alignment with? Where are these thoughts, these, these laws that they come up, these evil intents they have? It's saying either you're listening to the voice of the Lord and you're advancing his kingdom or you're listening to the kingdom of darkness and advancing his kingdom. It's not, there's no, yeah, you, how many of you ever thought Woodland Park is middle ground? So yes, all the demons are in the springs and, and, uh, and you have a Christian center up here, but we're just in middle ground. None of that's going on here. Well, the Bible doesn't give that as a reality at all. It's saying it's either one or the other. So principalities exercise influence. I already said that, sorry. What's the role and the influence of them? Principalities control human structures, and, and you have to get these three, human structures, ideologies, and worldviews. All right, so let's take what an ideology is. It's a... It's a pattern of thought that people create that they call reality, all right? So an ideology is someone who has authority, says this is reality, this is how we should live, this is what we think is important. And you have to ask just a basic question, where did they get this idea of that's how reality is? So you always ask what's called foundational questions. Why do p cultures push something? the way they do. So we're here. Um, you guys have come. Um, a lot of times we don't talk about this a lot. We kind of veer away from it, but I'm here just to have straightforward conversations with you. So just, just look at our culture right now. Why do we push killing infants? Where, where is that coming from? Now it's coming from authority, isn't it? And they're telling you everyone should think this way. And they use the argument that your rights are being violated if you can't murder a child. Now, you guys know that that's nonsense, right? But, but people, in their pride, get agitated by this. But this is not, people don't naturally wake up one day and say, you know, our goal should be to slaughter the next generation. 
That doesn't come from the kingdom of God. That's not one of his priorities, and that's not how he thinks about stuff. So the slaughter of children comes from the kingdom of darkness because they're made in the very image of God. Also, where does the culture, now, now you and I are, uh, it's not funny, but it's so obvious. In the last several years, we've been told that no one even knows their identity anymore, and you can just pick whatever sex you want to be. That doesn't come from the kingdom of God. That comes from the kingdom of darkness. Just for enjoyment's sake, I know you guys love this kind of stuff. Um, Back in the Old Testament, one of the false gods that they struggled with was Isis. All right? She was married to a Baal. And one of the things they used to do, and I don't know if you noticed this in the United States, but they used to have a festival to Isis during the month of June, where they spent the whole month worshiping Isis, and they had what was called a pride parade. And the focus of the pride parade was if to be a... Uh, a priest in the temple of Isis, you had to actually have your genitals mutilated so that you could either both be both male and female. This is what Isis wanted. And they spent the whole month celebrating Isis so that they could draw from her to come into a culture to create, ready, perversion sexually in the culture. They even have a high day where they actually pray for the demons to come so that it will create homosexuals among men. Now, isn't that amazing that that was the way the ancient cultures were? They took a whole month to celebrate Isis, and they had festivals, and they walked in the streets, and they, they actually, this is going to shock you, but they actually took the rainbow as their symbol to glorify Isis in the culture. Now, isn't that amazing? What would you think if you saw that happening today? <laughs> so people are like, oh, these things, they don't do these things. No, demons do these things all the time. When a culture turns away from the Lord, it, it creates a vacuum. And principalities come into regions and they do this kind of stuff. So everybody's like, no, this is just those people expressing themselves. But the Bible says our struggle is not with people. Our struggle is with these beings and them trying to influence it. Isn't it amazing that in the day and age we live in, this is actually going on, and the church is just watching it, assuming, well, there's nothing we could do about it. Now, I'm going to say this. I hope you don't get irritated like I do because I can get people excited about stuff. But are you ready? At some level, this should start bothering you enough where you start learning how to have authority in a region so that that's not just allowed to come and decimate the culture. All right, so I got a couple of amens. Let's keep moving on. <laughs> so principalities uh, promote and enforce spiritual and cultural norms that align with their purpose. So everyone's like, well, how do we know what they're about? Guys, if you just go into the culture and open your eyes and start looking what's going on in the culture, you can see what you're dealing with by what evil is promoted, accepted, and is flourishing in the culture. So uh, I don't know, the people that live up here in Woodland Park, I know some of you are from the Springs, some of you are from Denver, but look at the city. What is being accepted as, and constantly gaining ground in evil? You're seeing an expression of a personality that's orchestrating that to happen. All right, so um, because uh, they want to do this, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes to make sure. They do it intentionally through government. They do it through media, the arts, and the spheres of society. So they're working in all three areas. They want to influence government, education, media, arts, and other spheres of society. Principalities promote and enforce spiritual and cultural norms. And then it, it, they want to align to that to keep it going into the culture. So you guys know, ultimately, uh, any principality that's given ground, their ultimate goal is what's called the destruction of that culture. It does, there's no benefit from what they do. It's destruction of the culture. Now, this is intense, and it's kind of hard to listen to and move forward, so let's just back up for a moment and look at what we saw in Luke chapter 10. Jesus has given you the authority over all this. And so you have to begin to learn, how does God want me to address this in this region? 
And I'll get into how um, people are afraid. Well, can you go after these things? Yes, you can, but you don't do it without the Lord directing you to do it. Your safety is in the presence of the Lord, not just here's what they're doing, so let's go after it. That's what causes problems is people trying to move against things the Lord hasn't shown them how to do. All right, so the next thing is this. Uh, Number three, spiritual warfare and engagement of them. It's recognizing, discerning them. uh, That causes us to have effective spiritual warfare. It's engaging them through prayer, intercession, and strategic spiritual warfare. So I'll explain the last one here in a moment. But let's just stop for a moment and have a conversation about prayer. (laughs) It's kind of fun to do this. Most uh, Western Christianity struggles with what the effectiveness of prayer is. Like, can prayer really actually change stuff? And most of you in this room, you're here because you assume it actually does. But I want to just kind of dive into this with you a little deeper. The Bible actually gives several things about prayer, prayer and intercession, and prayer and worship that actually deals with what's called an invading influence of evil in a culture. All right? So why is that? When a people come in prayer, first and foremost, is relating to the Lord. When I come in alignment with the Lord, it is changing the authority atmosphere in a region just by you engaging and praying to the Lord. Also, when you, the word intercession, it means to cause a meeting to happen. So you're praying for someone that's engaged in evil, Right? When you say, Lord, would you go meet that person? The minute you say, go meet them, a greater power is coming and binding the activity that's going on in that person's life. Also, turn with me to Psalms 149, and let's look at this real quick. And we're going to look at verse 6 specifically. So this is talking about praise, and it's now going to use praise as a form of warfare. All right? Now, praise does what? It, um, It says, God inhabits the praises of his people. All right? Now, I'll go back to that in a moment, but look at with me at verse 6 in Psalms 149. Let the high praises of God be on their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people. Now he's saying, just by praising, look what it does, to bind the kings with chains. So why would you need to bind kings with chains? Because they're doing something evil. All right? And they're nobles with fetters. So do nobles um, come up with really dumb ideas that are evil that affect cultures? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then to execute the judgment written, this is the honor of his glory one, uh, uh, sorry, his godly ones, praise the Lord. So he's saying this is the honor that God has given us as his people. When we gather and offer a sacrifice of praise, he says, you don't have to understand it. I'm just telling you how it works. When you begin to praise and worship me, I go to the leaders that are trying to do evil and I bind them from doing it. Um, that term sacrifice of praise. So we always think of atonement like animals you have to sacrifice or pray. Oh, I have to pray. I don't feel like it, but it's a sacrifice. That's not what it, that word for sacrifice doesn't mean that. There are several forms of sacrifice or forms of worship that are acceptable to the Lord. And one of them is praise. That's acceptable to the Lord. So when you praise the Lord, that's a sacrifice that's acceptable and pleasing in his sight. Why? Because of the effect we just talked about. Praise and worship affects you, but it affects the whole entire region that you live in. So if you study any move of God through human history, you see the same phenomenon. There, there becomes this really high standard of prayer, intercession, and worship that goes on, and the culture keeps getting inundated and empowered by the presence of the Lord. Why? When it says God inhabits the praises of his people, right? That word for inhabit means to enthrone. Now, you're like, okay, great. But what does that mean? When you praise the Lord and worship the Lord, 
That word enthroned means God comes as the authority and settles where you're at. Anytime the king comes and settles where you at, he executes his reign in a region. So you guys get it? I'm praising and worshiping the Lord. God's saying, do you understand how powerful that is? You're inviting me to enthrone myself right in that region. And anything that is resisting what I want to do in that region, he's actively moving against it while you're enjoying him. Isn't the kingdom interesting and dynamic? So here we're talking about, well, how do we deal with it? Well, the weapons of our warfare are powerful because they're not us trying to, in the power of our flesh, go against this. It's actually being called to do something we already enjoy doing. He says, engage in that, and I'll start dealing with this stuff. Um, This is why another reason we talk about these principles and we start working through them is because we don't see their influence. So when the Lord says, hey, go do this stuff, and we don't do it, and then we're like, wow, everything seems to be overrun by evil, we never connect the two. When you have prayer, worship, intercession going on in a community of believers, and it's ever increasing, it diminishes the effect of evil consistently. Wow, I feel like I'm about to take off 20 different directions. But as we're talking about God actually changing this city, this is why God says, hey, you need to spend more than, uh, did you guys know, did you know that they did a survey in Western Christianity, how long ministers spend in prayer? It's really exciting. You guys ready? How much time do you think ministers spend in prayer on a daily basis? Yeah, you know because you've heard me do this. Okay, so the answer is five minutes. Okay, so the average minister in the United States spends five minutes or less praying a day. Does anyone want to take a guess? How, how, how much time do you think the average believer spends in prayer on a daily basis? You're allowed to say, Brian, shut up and leave me alone. A couple minutes if ministers only do five. Okay, so a couple. What, what do you think? Ten, all right. Half an hour. A couple minutes, minutes, all right. Less than five. five. You want to take a shot? Two. Two, okay. Go ahead. Uh, 50 seconds. seconds. (laughs) All right. You guys ready? It's uh, three minutes. The average believer in Western Christianity spends three minutes a day. Now, isn't that amazing? Now, I didn't say you guys did that. I'm just telling you this is what's considered average in Western Christianity. So when we say, uh, wow, it just seems like evil is just prevailing, and yet we spend little or no time with the Lord, we don't ever connect the two and say, actually, if we just spend a little more time with the Lord, we'd actually see this effect start happening. Um, This is why uh, there's always this obscure minister always on the saints' backs going, hey, guys, let's get into a prayer meeting. (laughs) Prayer really does change nations. But we think, well, standing and talking to God in a room, why does that change nations? Well, if you you ever are in those groups and you start doing it and you see it actually change a nation, you get it. If you're not in it, it just seems like it's a, a mystery. What, so I have to give time, and if I do that, God will rule and change the nations? Absolutely. Don't give time. I don't obey the Lord, and then I'm confused why the culture is being overrun. Uh, that's why. All right, so let's keep moving on. So I have this. Uh, you might not have ever heard this. We're in number four. It says identifying and mapping principalities. This is in identifying them and understanding their cultural and their historical context. So, again, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I want to introduce this to you. Cities have histories that spirits have worked through. And so if you spend some time studying the history of a city, like I went and did a historical study of the town I lived in, which is really interesting. Um, The town I lived in, um, they allowed a minister in that town to starve to death. I thought that was interesting. That's the history of the town I live in. And um, they, they, um, 
So they, they have this history where they, they don't support the work of the gospel and they have this attitude towards the gospel in the town that I live in that there, there's not a value to the kingdom of God. And what what's our town is known for, this, the town I live in, is poverty. We have poverty all over the place in the town that I live in. Uh, and everyone just assumes, well, that's just where all the poor people live. But we have unbelievable amount of poor people and poor communities in this little itty-bitty town that I live in, right? But one thing happened in the town we lived in. You can, you can guys realize you can go to the public library. Someone has written a history book on your town. Uh, there was a lady. Um, her name was Carrie A Nation. Isn't that funny? <laughs> she was a woman preacher in the early 1900s. And to stop alcoholism in my small town, she used to go from bar to bar with a hatchet, destroying bars. Um, And we didn't have a bar in Belton for, what, 70 years? There was never a bar anywhere in Belton. We had one bar that appeared, and the guy got saved. So we still don't have bars in Belton. So, guys, there's... Influences of the kingdom, and there's influences of the kingdom of darkness. And so your city didn't just, you guys get it, we moved to our city and went, well, I'm here. This city had a whole history behind it that had spiritual influence in it. And God is trying to teach us, well, hey, actually pay attention to that, because some of the things that are considered normal that the kingdom of darkness has done, that's come from someone, person, and authority establishing it in the region. All right, let's keep moving on. We're going to take our first break here in a moment. Let's just finish with this. So when we, people use terms like strategic level spiritual warfare, they're talking about including things like this. Prayer walks, targeted intercession, and dealing with spiritual strongholds in communities. Um, so here in Woodland Park, if you're not from here, I'm going to tell a story. This involves Melanie, the lady that came up and prayed for me. So She's praying one day. I'm probably going to get the story wrong, so after the break, she's going to have to correct me, but this is how I remember the story. She had the Lord come to her and tell her, hey, you need to actually put a a tent over here and read the whole entire Bible over the region. That's kind of how it went, right? Okay, so I got that part right. Now, why in the world would God make someone put a tent out over here and have different people from the body of Christ come and read the whole entire scripture over this region? Because you're, you're engaging in spiritual activity. It seems silly to you, but it's exactly how God goes through communities and starts tearing down strongholds. Um, maybe I'll do this. I'll help a little bit. When I... When I got involved in this, um, I was just clueless like most of us are. We just kind of run into these things. I was invited to a town called Fairfield, Iowa. And in Fairfield, the Maharishi that trained the Beatles to do uh, transcendental meditation, his world headquarters, he goes to this small town in Iowa and purchases basically the college. And if you've ever read This Present Darkness, I believe that Frank Peretti just went to Fairfield, Iowa and then wrote the book. All right? (laughs) The, the city is controlled by the Maharishi. Do you know it's illegal in the United States to make up any other currency that's not your currency? And they have their own currency there. And no one from the federal government ever comes and confronts them on it. I mean, it's just amazing. They've influenced every church to practice transcendental meditation. Now, do you know that practicing transcendental meditation is channeling spirit guides or demons? And they have the Christian churches, except for one, teaching their congregants how to practice transcendental meditation. So I get invited to that city to teach the school of the prophetic, and I'd have one or two people show up, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I kept begging the Lord, please don't let me go here anymore. (laughs) And the Lord said, no, you're here on purpose. I want to train you on stuff. So guys, uh, how many of you would do meetings for five years with one person showing up? (laughs) Well, I guess I would because I did it for five years. And we would get done with the meetings, and the first year I had to just stop being discouraged. I just thought, wow, I'm just wasting my time. And the Lord, every time I'd pray, and Lord, really? I'd even beg him, please, 
let me not go there anymore. And the Lord's like, no, you're required to go there. I'm training you to do something. So I'm there. After you do meetings with one person and you learn to stop getting discouraged, then God started, the person that was traveling with me, the Lord started having conversations with us, both of us, and we'd just start talking to him about it. It's like, you know, it's interesting. The Lord told me that we're actually supposed to go around the campus and, and um, start praying and burying scriptures in the ground. And he'd say, oh my goodness, the Lord told me the same thing. So the next month we were going, we'd get done with the training with one person, and then we'd sit there and go, all right, well, let's ask the Lord what we're supposed to do. And we would start following the Lord. Now, guys, they have security guards at this, comp- uh, this campus, so we'd have to wait for him to drive by and then run as fast as we could, <laughs> dig a hole, put the scripture in there, pray the blessing of God, and run back to our cars. I mean, and we're both in our 30s and 40s, and, we're, and we look like teenagers. And then another month, the Lord's uh, teaching me about the, what's called an offering of salt. Did you know there's an offering of salt in the Old Testament? I, I'd never heard of that. And so the Lord's saying, okay, so I want you to go to each one of the gates, and I want you to take water and anoint it and put it on the gate, and then I want you to throw salt on it, and I want you to bind every spirit. And I'm just like, where is a manual to do this? I mean, we're, we're having to do it by the Lord leading us. Well, what starts happening? We start hearing that they can't channel their spirits anymore. They're, they're having a hard time with it. And, and then all of a sudden, one of their main gurus gets saved. <laughs> so do you guys get it? These silly little things that, these, uh, that God leads us to do, we think, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. And yet, if God leads it, it's just like how he led the nation of Israel. Do you remember? He led them to take a city by doing a worship service around the city seven times. His weapons or his tools are completely different than ours, all right? So when we do this kind of stuff, a stronghold, ready? Anything that God speaks you to do, and he says, do this in response to this thing, when you do it, he releases his power to decimate strongholds. And strongholds are how people think about things. All right? So when we worship, it breaks strongholds. When we uh, actually literally speak the Bible out, it breaks strongholds because the voice of the Lord has led us to do this. All right. Last section, it says we have authority as the church. We have corporate worship. We have... uh, I have to do this. We have, to, we have unity and we have spiritual gifts as instruments to confront this. Okay. I taught, this, I taught the worship aspect where God enthrones himself. One of the other reasons that um, we don't have the breakthrough that we're looking for either in our families or in our communities is because it's hard to say this because it's not fun to hear it. But the body of Christ is fighting way too much with each other. And... There's a psalm, I'm going to, I'm not remembering, I think it's Psalms 143 if I remember what right, but it talks about God has a commanded blessing that he pronounces on the believers when they dwell together in unity. So he says there's a commanded blessing, and then if you look at it, it's actually symbolic language, and it starts with this idea of oil being poured down Aaron's beard and going through all his garments. And then it uses an illustration of it's like dew hitting a mountain and flooding through and watering every part of the vegetation on the mountain. Both of them say that when believers come together, his people get the anointing that will saturate every part of them. So everybody in the community will be blessed when the believers come together and dwell together in unity. And the mountain represents nations. And so if the believers will come together, God says, I'll command a blessing that will come to my children, and then I'll hit the culture. And that idea of it hitting the mountain with dew, dew represents refreshing and blessing that only comes from the Lord. So protection for your culture against crime, the businesses flourishing, people actually succeeding instead of fighting stuff. God said, I'll command a blessing to hit And it'll start at the top, and it'll just work through every part of the culture where the culture recognizes we're blessed by the Lord. So isn't that amazing? 
we can do the, most of us do the first part. We all gather in our buildings together and we worship the Lord, but the body of Christ in the community doesn't recognize their identity. And you're, mi- you guys get it? You're missing the spoken blessing that God wants to release. And I've thought about this. You guys tell me I, I'm still working on it, but I don't think you can get the body of Christ to come together in unity over doctrine. Uh, don't, now, don't get discouraged. I hang out with teachers all the time. We love arguing scripture. It's kind of fun. It's like, how do you see this passage? This is how I see it. So it's not, you're not going to create unity by getting 10 teachers from 10 different groups saying, let's all preach and agree on the same doctrine. That just isn't going to happen. But I think you can create unity by have worshiping sessions where the community comes together and worships the Lord. Did you know that um, as I was explaining that stuff in Brazil, they had, they've been under what they would call revival for the last 25 years, and the leaders in that region actually have stadiums that they rent out, and the believers gather for all night of just praise. Can you imagine all night praise and worship? And through, they're not trying to resolve their doctrinal issues. They're just gather the body of Christ for praise and worship in stadiums every Friday night to Saturday. Isn't that amazing? And God stopped, has broken the power of the cartel in that nation. God has caused this move of the Spirit, and it constantly is going because the body of Christ understood what the Scripture said. So if we're going to break what principalities are doing in regions, we don't have to sit there and yell at them. We have to start worshiping the Lord and calling the body of Christ to come together to celebrate the Lord together. Then they will have us speak to things and deal with things. We have to build the proper foundation. All right, so guys, take your notes, close them for a second. Let me pray a blessing on you. Let me explain real quick, if you, if you don't come here to this congregation. The restrooms are literally, you head out this doorway right here, and you turn and go down the stairs. And when you come down the stairs, like we're downstairs, the first turn, there's a doorway that goes to the left. You just take that, and the men's and women's restrooms are right there. All right, so I'm going to pray a blessing over you. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to come back, all right? So please join me. All right, so Lord, as we begin to work through this, we ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to challenge us. Let us begin to see things the way that you do. Let us begin to walk in the authority that you have given us. Cause us to have our eyes open to see. Now, Lord, we've come here not just to learn about this stuff, but to be a change. We really want to come under discipling nations. So teach us your ways, O God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 